All right, so this is John Reed of Diginomica, and this is my first remote podcast taping in a long time. Uh, so that must mean it's a big event, and yes, it is. It's it's myself and and Hank Barnes from Gartner. Hank, how's it going? Going all right. I guess I am I honored to be remote, or is it just <laughs> the fact that I spend you know I meet your coworkers and haven't met you face to face? Right. What's going on? Right. You've been blowing me off in the face to face, but <laughs> but uh, but no, it, it's actually because you and I have this twisted passion for really understanding what the modern enterprise buyer is all about. And we, you and I have been having back and forth on this for, for a long time that I think has been, I think pretty productive And you guys in your, in your go-to-market advisory group at Gartner, you've come out with a bunch of new research on buyers that kind of adds new fuel to our conversations. That's why we're here today. I know you've been presenting this at shows as well and getting some initial feedback. So I, probably getting a lot of interesting reactions so far. Yeah, it, it really has been. And, and it's, it's a pretty broad study that we did. And um, part, you know, there's an element of the stuff I do that I, I actually find value when people come to me and say, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and, and it's stuff that seems to lurk just below the surface, but adds some additional context. And then hopefully, can cause both buyers and sellers to adapt their practices to to try and get better because we we desperately need to be better on all sides of the coin. Right, and uh, you're also fairly unique within Gartner because you're the only Gartner analyst who's ever written, I think, posts inspired by music that I know of, but in particular, uh, Devo, uh, the devolution of enterprise technology buying, which was uh, a riff on a post of mine. We won't go into all of that today, folks, but uh, I think uh, some of that is basically the sense that you were writing about in this devolution column around how we really haven't progressed very far. And I think that's the interesting tension because back in 2014, I wrote a piece called Informed Buyers in the Crisis of Tech differentiation. This was in the early days of Diginomica. And I said, uh, when was the last time you sat in on a webinar and said, man, that was really great. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, but I recently had that experience with uh, with a webinar of yours, which was my first encounter with your thinking on this, called the sad state of differentiation and what to do about it. And what it comes down to, I think, Hank, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's two very interesting tensions going on with enterprise buying right now. First of all, we have an informed buyer who is much more autonomous and has really changed uh, how marketing and sales need to behave in order to be relevant to this buyer. Uh, at the same time, if we if we idealize the informed buyer, we overlook something that you've documented quite a bit, which is that the buying process remains very complex and challenging for many buyers, and it's not at all as if they figured it all out. So that appears to me to be the tension that we're dealing with. If I'm, am I off on that or? I, I think you're right. I, I mean, the the one comment I would make is that um, it seems that informed may be a bit optimistic because mm-hmm. I, I think it's the buyers have more opportunity to be informed, but it's actually making many of them overwhelmed because right. they have so much information they can get in so many sources that they often find themselves questioning, did we find the right information and wondering what they're missing? And they get in this thrashing mode of always wondering is there something else? And and that gets them kind of stuck. Right. So being informed in a sense is something of a rabbit hole uh, where you can, you can also get really overwhelmed with everything out there. Uh, at the same time, I do think that, that when I talk with, with buyers at shows who are more active and who are checking peer review sites and doing more of their research and asking hard questions of me and of vendors and of their consulting partners, that is a new, a new animal. <laughs> it's a new breed of buyer when, when, when they do, even if they're not perfectly informed. I do notice a difference and, and I do think vendors by and large have failed to respond to that. We can get into that today and see if you agree with me or not on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely do. And, you know, some of this new research talks to that specifically. Um, we look at, um, we've created and, and we brought this in from the company we acquired CEB, the idea of what we call a high quality deal. And, and if we're talking about a high quality deal, we're talking about it from the perspective of a vendor, but there's certainly some customer perspectives in there. And for us, a high quality deal occurs when a few different things are happening. And so I'm gonna do a bit of a logic explanation. So the first and foremost is that the customer says, 
that they are meeting expectations. And specifically, we ask them, is this purchase failing or failed? Did it fail to meet expectations? And we give them a seven point scale to rank it on. And for a high quality deal, they got to rank that as a one or two. They got to pretty strongly disagree with the idea that it's failing. So right. by contrast, it's succeeding. And then one of two other things occurred. One of them is that they basically said that we did not compromise on our ambitions in making this solution choice. It's a similar type question that says, did we settle for something less than we started with? And we want people to disagree with that. Or they have to say, we bought a premium solution from a vendor. So as a vendor, if someone bought a premium solution for me and they're succeeding, or if they didn't compromise, so they don't feel like they were almost in regret mode before they started and they're not failing, that's a good deal for us. That's a high quality deal. Let's start with that, right? So, and anyone, I think, everyone should be aspiring for high quality deals, right? It, it ought to be a given. Well, we surveyed 1,464 different people that were involved in buying decisions. And we asked them about the project they were on where the most money was spent on technology. Only 27% of them fit the criteria of a high quality deal. Right. So we're already in a pretty bad state. But what was interesting, of those 27, what we saw is a significant portion, and it's between 40 and 50%, I'd have to get the specific number, as part of their buying process, after they engaged with the sales organization for the vendor they chose, they continued to use other sources. And in the best, and we gave them three groups. One was they continued to go to the vendor website. Second one was they continued to leverage information they got through vendor marketing campaigns. And the third was they went to independent sources of information, whether that be Gartner, Diginomica, review sites, whatever. If they went to all three of those, that was the highest likelihood of them having a high quality deal. The other thing that helped them significantly was using independent sources in combination with anything else or even by itself. If they just stayed within the world that the vendor was trying to control, their likelihood of a high quality deal diminished. And those that didn't use any independent sources, only like 20% of them had a high quality deal. So what's clearly we're seeing in this is that the informed buyer, part of being a smart informed buyer is leverage diverse opinions. Go to independent sources to validate claims and to test and get clarification. Embrace those different perspectives but also be clear on what you're trying to learn from each of them. Because if I just go out free form, that's when I get lost and into that rabbit hole we talked about. But if I'm looking to validate, is this as easy to roll out as they're saying? What are the tricks for adoption? I go looking for specific information to confirm those claims. Right. And uh, I think we've established then that the informed buyer is an aspirational ambition. And, and I would add to that, that, that that doesn't end when the, when the software decision is made, most of the project failures that I, that I dig into uh, look at an over-reliance on, on say one prime vendor, uh, essentially customers that aren't used to getting out and coming up for air more, which kind of ties into something you and I have been talking about a long time, which is this notion that, that we're more successful when we, when we can build, you know, networks of trusted, uh, experts and advisors around us as we go, uh, which isn't always an easy thing to do when your head's down at a company. Um, but one thing I wanted to just mention before we dig into your survey a little bit is that you've been trickling and teasing out results in some pretty interesting blog posts on your blog. So I'll make a point of including a link to that, but folks can get a feeling for some of your findings and you've also got webinars going on around this topic as well. Uh, one of your eye-opening posts from June 4th simply said, uh, many enterprise buyers resign to failure. And <laughs> that kind of ties into what you're talking about right here. It's just that success is certainly not preordained, preordained here, either in terms of software selection or the project itself. Uh, but one thing you kind of teased out was that there are differences in buying behavior between those that are achieving success and what you called the complacent 46%. So do you want to say just a little more about that? And then we'll dig into some of your findings here. Yeah, so, so let's start with this, uh, this idea of complacency. And, and it, it was you know, basically an interpretation based on a few different things. 
in this study, we dove in pretty hard into this idea of you know the biggest project people were on and and what things they were facing, um, and saw that forty six percent of them fit in this group of you know this is the biggest thing they were involved in. And it was failing to meet expectations, but we also asked them, well, what was your feeling about the overall buying experience, and what was your satisfaction with the experience during the buying process with the lead vendor? Mm. And the percentages were like 90% and 92. Like we're incredibly happy. The buying experience was great. Right. But then they're failing. And they also tell us that they significant portion of them said that within their own team, it was difficult. There were conflicting objectives and there were lots of disagreements and not necessarily pro productive disagreements and a big struggle to use consensus and that this was really, really complex. And yet we're okay with things in terms of buying. And, and it, there's this interesting mix throughout where we're constantly seeing some of this tension. I mean, we just talked about the idea of um, trust networks and, and going beyond the vendor, but we're also seeing some willingness to want to engage much deeper with the vendor too than we've seen in the past. Right. Some of these folks said, you know, one of the most valuable things for them is talking to a sales rep. And several years ago, that would have been the last thing on their minds they wanted to do. Um, but it's sorting this out and, and trying to, f is, is where buyers are still stuck and where we believe there's an opportunity for the vendor community. Right. Okay, so, and what's the name of your, what do you call this annual study? Um, it, it, the name changes every year. Um, this one, we it was like, it was end user buying behavior, right? Enterprise technology right. buying behavior is probably the best way to describe it. And 1,400 buyers, you looked at mid-sized to global companies. Uh, there's more detail on some of the blog posts. Um, I think you looked at a, almost 36,000 purchases or buyers had done almost 36,000 of those surveyed. And then I think there were something like 9,000 that didn't go ahead. Yeah. So, so some of the, let me, let me, cause it, it's interesting. And, and part of this is there were really three components to the survey um, that all are fueling research that we're providing to Gartner clients and that some of the stuff I am sharing in the blog. Um, so the first thing is you, you nailed it. The, the respondents had to work in a, mid-size or larger organization. And that's someone in Gartner terms that is over 50 million in revenue or, and over 100 employees. That had to be sort of that combination. We have public sector in there and there was really like an employee size metric. Um, they were typically managers or higher and they had to have personally been involved in buying in one or more technology categories. And we gave them seven to choose from and it's a couple different types of application. It's cloud. Um, it's security, it's IT outsourcing, professional services, some of those types. Um, as a note, the respondents told us that they were involved in about five different categories. Um, mm -hmm. And then we did an algorithm thing to assign them to say, okay, we want you to focus on one category. And this was the first section of the survey where what we were exploring, and I talked about this in the past, so it's sort of a second run of a, some research we did of just how much buying is going on. Um, and we put them into one category and we said, focus on application software, focus on infrastructure software. And we gave them a two year window and we basically asked them, how many buying efforts did you start? Right. Didn't necessarily meant they buy something, but they, you know, had some level of formal or informal buying team starting to investigate possibilities. Um, and that, so each respondent had one category and what we ended up with was close to 36,000 buying efforts. So it average the mean was twenty five point seven. Um, now, in that there were two different categories there. One was planned per, planned buying efforts. So effectively, right. it, something they budgeted or there was a strategic plan that said we know we need to investigate that. Then he had the ad hoc. Right, ad hoc is if yep. something happened right that triggered us to say hey we need to think about that. And what we see is that nearly half, it's just 45, 46%, depending on how you cut it, of these buying efforts are ad hoc. And, and part of this is traditional metrics where we rely heavily on budget to be a qualifier for a lead as a vendor aren't so good anymore if I got that much ad hoc buying going on. Mm, mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And the other thing that I wanted to throw in to this mix is that you, you guys are branding some, some exciting new 
buzz phrases for us. Um, <laughs> and, and we're going to get to those in a sec. Uh, but, but the thing I that I... Wait, 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 wait a second. If we do a podcast and I say a Gartner buzz phrase, is that like a guarantee strike through in... Yeah, in uh, hits and misses, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're you're and and I would say continuous customer behaviors is um is is right in there. Um, you're, you're a good candidate, but 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 basically, there's something important going on underneath that, which is that the sales cycle is as we know it is really gone or broken or different, right? And 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 even the short list, which is kind of the sacrosanct thing of like we've narrowed it down to three vendors. You point out that even that is no longer set in stone that that you can run into something new buyer can can go to a show and and get provoked by a new presentation uh, i would almost translate this into that there's not even a formal buying cycle anymore in the way that there once was so but 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 part of this is what you're trying to get at i think with this notion of continuous buying and continuous customer behavior to to to, to land on your buzz phrase there so so want to say a little more about that yeah it, um what I, what I think happens, and again, we, we have these two ways of looking at enterprise buying that are constantly, you know, aligned and misaligned. And it's the perspective from the vendor and the perspective from the customer. And as a vendor, I'm thinking of, of it and I'm working on an opportunity with a client. And that's my world with the client. And I kind of think that's the client's world. But the real world for the client is, yeah, they're working on that but they're probably looking at three or four other things, maybe in other categories. They also bought some stuff and they may be involved in the implementation or questions from the implementation team at some level. And just that volume, that's where continuous comes in because we can't think of these things as discrete. Everything relates to another and particularly as I'm moving into subscription models where I'm constantly thinking, you know, unless, you know, beyond being locked up in a three-year contract that kind of tries to put the shackles back on, am I getting value? Should I do something different? What's the cost of changing? And that's where we see this cycle of we're constantly looking for stuff. We're deciding to move forward. We're deciding not to, and everything starts to intertwine. And as a vendor, the customer is constantly trying to change because of all the people telling them about being disrupted and trying to deal with competition and others, right? That's where we think is driving the volume. But the vendor, I don't live in that world as a vacuum. I'm part of that, and I have to recognize all those other things that are going on. And if I think of it as discrete my project, uh, I'm not thinking of it the right way. I need to think of, and you brought it up, right? It's not just the sale. It's what happens after the sale. And all of these things are starting to connect together. So that's where we came up with continuous. It was driven off of another Gartner buzzword called continuous next, but we don't have to go there. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see if it sticks to the wall, but I, th I think there there certainly is a re a reason for for branding that and 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 what I would say that I found very interesting there is that I th there's a tension for vendors here because there the subscription economy, if you will, or cloud based subscriptions, there there's this sense that go live is no longer this discrete event of handshakes and smiles and really it never should have been that uh that's just the beginning of your proving ground and and my view then is when you talk about uh buyers wanting to talk to sales reps more and engage with them more it's because they want to form a partnership and they want a so-called experience with that vendor that 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 it that feels collaborative from the beginning until the end. They want to trust that vendor. They want that vendor to to be giving them proper advice and counsel across the way. Where I think vendors are getting into trouble, which is something you were pointing out, is that just because buyers want that doesn't mean that vendors are in control anymore. And that I think is a real key issue here. I think that's the perfect way to put it. Right. And 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 you nail it and we are definitely on the same page. Is is I would take it even further. It's not just that buyers want it. I think they've recognized that they need it, right? These things are, uh, and again, it's this combination and the pressure and, and the risk of failure and, and just how much it impacts my business. Um, I can't do this with a traditional hands-off vendor relationship. Right. I need help, right? And, and that help, as you say, doesn't mean control. Um, because I'm, I'm not looking for that. I'm just looking for you to help me make sense of all this, right? Help me connect to other sources. Give me the evidence, right? We, we hear buyers say that 
you know, the biggest thing vendors can do to help them is be more responsive, but that doesn't mean respond to their women. Help clarify for them what they've learned from others that they should be asking. Right. And if they come with a question, if it's the wrong question, guide them, right? And and don't hide things. Don't try and trick them. You know, buyers aren't dumb. And, and you know, how long have we been doing tech, right? We're, we're old guys. It's probably why it's good this is a podcast versus a video. Exactly. Um, right? But it's but we still are learning and and the the things are changing and it's just we we struggle we we know the things are wrong but we're not sure of the things that are right and if we can work together to do that with collaborative opinions that come from multiple places then everybody wins and we see that from our data right the high quality deal i jumped into really early right being smart you know, we talk about diversity and other things. It's, you know, diversity of culture, diversity of opinions, getting other perspectives helps us get further. Um, having some guidelines so we don't take it in all directions helps us get further faster. Right. So the interesting thing about this is that vendors do need to go through, I think, a, a bit of a 12-step program around their lack of control because when I see them attempting to assert control via so-called personalized messaging and stuff. Uh, it's always a disaster. I, you know, every time I come back from a show, I get all kinds of ridiculous pings because people scan my badges as now they're going fishing. Um, that's not control. And, and, and we'll talk about how buyers do refer to all these third party sources and they refer to their peers. Uh, they, they're trying to improve their BS filter and, and you don't have control. And I think vendors do need to start just like any 12 step, you have to move from denial to acceptance. <laughs> right. but, but the interesting thing about that, which I think um, you've done a good job of laying out in some of your posts is that, that there is a lot that software vendors can do under those circumstances. And some of those things take a fair amount of work, such as developing a genuine influencer relations strategy, uh, analyst relations and what have you, uh, developing customer advocacy programs, which is something you and I both believe in. But there's also much simpler things. You've done some very interesting posts on simply the lack of vendor-related information because even though uh, buyers do want to read independent views, they also want to understand uh, what your products are all about. And and I've, you wrote a post uh, in the middle of this month of June on the one thing providers could do to make buying easier. And a lot of it, to me, was uh, it was responsiveness, but then it's also just sharing information, uh, you know, which is, I think, a radically underestimated step. I'm always amazed. Y y you write in your in the, in the webinar, you said that the it's all about the details. Like consensus buying means that I need to be able to pass along product and informational details to to the other people in the process. And a lot of vendors still haven't stepped up even on that front. Well, and it I, I, it takes extra steps. Right, and and it's often I, I think again it's based on this somewhat um, whether it's just this misguided view of control or sort of adapting to the new buying process where we think at different stages of our sales cycle we need to give them different information. Right, you touched on the fact, right? Buyers, in order to buy, I want to understand what it's going to be like to be a customer, and if you tell me things like well, the implementation guides on our support site and you try and delay them from reading or worry about that stuff once you buy, that's not what they care about, right? Implementation guides is in the top four of the type of content that buyers are looking for now. They want details. They, and as, as I meant, you mentioned, part of this is they got to make the case with other people. Right. And we create some interesting things. We're doing a podcast, right? We'll see how long it is after you get done editing it, right? But right. effectively... That and the webinar that you watch to prepare for this, I got to give you 45 minutes of my time. Right. When you present these podcasts or when Den does or others, you usually write an article with it and you highlight some key points, right? That helps people decide, do I want to invest the time, right? Videos are something that we see every vendor investing a tremendous amount of money in. And buyers tell us it's pretty low on their list of things that actually help them buy. Right. Part of it is how do I share a video and tell someone, hey, go listen to this podcast with Hank and John. Give me 45 minutes versus say, go to this podcast and at 15 minutes in, there's a two-minute snip of that everyone on our team needs to hear. If you do that, then it's useful. For you the others, people are like, am I going to give you the time? And so we need to think consciously about 
what happens next and what's going on in the buyer's world because they have these issues. And that's some of the stuff we talked about in the thing is they have these issues of conflict. They have these issues of disagreement, right? We spend all this money on personas and all our things on personas is let's make sure we appeal to these uniquely as an individual. And we're probably setting up where when they get together as a group, we're actually making them fight more than we want. 